I don't think this one is ripe yet. Uh, but hello, everybody. Welcome to the channel, back to the channel. And today, as, as if by pure happenstance, we have a lineup of some very iconic round tables of the French early 19th century to take a look at here. Now, as usual, the goal is going to be to interest collectors and seasoned enthusiasts, but if you are new to the subject of furniture from the past, I hope that these videos will help you understand a little bit better what types of it are most valuable and why, specifically through focusing on works of pre-industrial decorative art, which really differ in every way from what we generally qualify as antiques. Now these are benchmark examples of fine domestic tables, basically the highest tier of this sort of publication quality luxury table that we might encounter before entering into a whole other tier of work of decorative art. Now the two tables on the end of our lineup demonstrate two different sizes of the exact same table, but they are identical to one which is conserved in the French Ministry of Culture's National Furniture Reserve, Mobilier National. And so for that reason, that's why I think that pieces like this are relevant to preserve online, relevant to provide a little bit of extra video footage for, for as long as the internet lasts. Because as collectors, we are drawn to something for how it stands out as a work of art, for its success as a work of art, and then we compare it to and evaluate that based on how it stands up to other items in its class. But in order to do that, we actually have to experience the other items in its class. Anyway, I found the little version of this pyramid-based tripod table, this emblematic model of the French Napoleonic Empire from about 1800 to 1815. I found this one at the Chateau de Pontchartrain when it was liquidated a few years ago. And at Pontchartrain, there were quite a lot of pieces, 20th century empire copies. And, uh, you know, this one was actually lurking in sort of a vacant, dusty room. It was very dirty itself. And the bronzes were tarnished to the point where you could not see that they were gilded bronzes. And that's actually a very interesting part of this table, these winged victories here, these elements in gilded bronze. Because oftentimes on empire pieces, you're going to see 20th century bronzes nailed to kind of mediocre empire pieces as a way to sort of, sort of enhance them in an aftermarket way that isn't terribly genuine. But on this, I believe we're dealing with actual bronzes from the empire period, which I cleaned myself. This table also shows us the Belgian gray Saint Anne marble, which is one of the more normal marbles of the day. But nevertheless, that could have been a style choice, but we do associate that Belgian Saint Anne gray marble with being a little bit more of an everyday marble compared to the Bleu Turquin that we see over here on the larger version of the very same table. And we see the Bleu Turquin features a little gorge that runs around the edge. That's a sign of quality. And then as we take a look at the wonderful veneers here that have been applied to the oak frame, the beautiful oak frame of this pyramid-shaped base, we notice why this mahogany is referred to as flame mahogany, because it's beautifully matched here and it appears to billow up this pyramid like a flame. And then we see on both of the tables these wonderful claw feet, which would have been carved out of a block of solid mahogany. The one with the blue marble seems to no, it's missing its casters. They've been replaced with little metal caps, as have those. Now, you know, the old casters, to begin with, probably didn't work very well, but I wouldn't recommend rolling a table like this around. This one does retain its casters, but the second you start to roll it, the more you see that with a 200-year-old period piece, it's best to remove the marble, lift the table. But anyway, those claw feet are just part of this neoclassical decorative repertoire, a wink back to ancient Egypt, when of course the Egyptians believed that the power of the animal would be imbued to the user of the furniture. And we see that claw foot action going on on all of these neoclassical tables. But why don't we take the marbles off so that we can briefly take a look at the hidden parts of these pieces, kind of like looking at the back of a painting at the back of a canvas, except that here we see with the art of furniture back then, there's a whole technical craft, a mastery, a whole separate art going on beneath the aesthetics of these wonderful works of art. And so we can just see the excellence of the precision with which this item was designed and executed. But what I want you to take a look at is inside of the tabletop here, which rises up a couple of inches before meeting the marble, you're going to see that this lip, which all of the tables but one feature, the lip, is formed 
out of an interlocking series of little oak boards which have been bent such that when they're all together we have a perfect circle. And now the reason why these tabletops are built up and they're not just a flat section of wood is of course to support, to better support the weight of the marble which is constantly bearing down on them. But over time, if this lip hasn't been built up as it wasn't built here into the design of this table, the flatter support of the marble here has now begun to warp. Now originally that, that gives the marble of this particularly unusual table sort of the effect of, of floating on top of this lotus flower baluster here, and that's wonderful, but we can see it's a little impractical over time because this flat board has now warped. Anyway, we see that these tables, all of them, but particularly these two as they're taken apart in video, we see that they are held together by this typically early 19th century metal rod that goes down into the very bottom of the table and then all of the different parts of the table are held together, uh, tightened together by an original metal nut. These are reassuringly 19th century, early 19th century metal nuts here as we see that we're dealing with some blackened strange iron alloy, steel iron alloy, and then we see that these metal nuts are very irregular compared to the metal that we would see coming from a hardware store today. Not to get too scientific. Next, why don't we go ahead and take a look at the white marble table here, which is the largest. It is unusually large, while also being kind of the prototypical model of tripod table, one of the more common ones. However, the reason it's common is just because it's so attractive that in the repertoire of very rare period furniture, we tend to encounter, albeit the smaller version of this table, more often. That being said, that doesn't mean that it isn't artistically relevant as we see the smaller version of this table with a darker marble conserved and displayed in Louis Philippe's bedroom, King Louis Philippe's bedroom at the Chateau d'Amboise. Now, what's special about this table is that it is another 12 inches larger in diameter, it seems, and we've noticed here that the tripod, the lion's claws, do not actually support the weight. The lion's claws are actually just added to the weight supporting tripod which is in fact parallel to the floor. And I believe that this is sort of a design constraint because when you get up into this type of a diameter, well you've exponentially increased the weight of the marble and I can tell you from experience that moving this marble is very much a pain and that could perhaps tie into why you see relatively so few of this attractive but quite a bit larger model of table. And again, we're dealing with this robust neoclassicism here, the final breath of the empire, the final breath of the restoration period, with these outrageous lion's claws that are topped with an acanthus leaf that scrolls into a volute. And then the center of the piece is a gadrooned vase, the gadroons here, the frieze of them, that's a decorative element that you would see on Roman sarcophagi. And while we're down here, we should really just take a look at, the, at these wonderfully sculpted muscular lion's claws here. So anyway, like the two pyramid-shaped claw feet tables, we have more very outrageous neoclassicism going on with this, with this table. Now finally, everybody, let's take a look at the last table, which is really the most unusual, the most beautiful in my opinion, and it is this lotus flower baluster model of table, which we rarely see. And not only is it this rare model, but it is perfectly French polished, such that we really see the beauty of these matching panels of flame mahogany on top of each leg of the tripod. And we see also the precision with which the claw feet were sculpted, the shins of which are formed by this sort of lotus flower, lotus leaf, water plant evoking volute, as really the theme here is the classical tropics. The only problem with this table is part of what gives it this ethereal sort of otherworldly vibe is, well, it does not have the same lip that the other tables have, which are so critical apparently to their construction. The marble appears to be free floating, but the small flap of wood which used to support it has now warped away such that the marble is dangerously supported by the top of the metal rod right in the center. It seems to be doing all right, but if there's a master furniture maker or anyone with some experience as to how to go about perhaps restoring this, please chime in. 
And now if we look at the underside of this table though, we're going to see the wonderful joinery of it with these precise dovetails that hold the legs on. And we also see somewhat of the unfinished side of a hidden part of a period piece as we've discussed in other videos. They wouldn't go to the trouble to beautify the unseen parts in the pre-industrial age. And then finally, we see that the marble on this is a particularly well striated example of this bleu turquin, this indigenous French blue marble. And so, with the day coming to a close, everybody, I very much hope that you've enjoyed taking a look at these iconic tables. I hope that this will serve to inform your own collecting. And if you are already a seasoned enthusiast, I hope at the very least that these videos have interested you. And please do subscribe to the channel if you would like to support this endeavor of spreading some knowledge of the decorative arts and of, you know, building an online library of the most compelling pieces that I encounter. Thank you. <laughs>